Anti-Federalist Number 4, Foreign Wars, Civil Wars, and Indian Wars, Three Bugbears. Patrick Henry uh, was really a, the center at this time. Uh, he's a very emotional writer. This is uh, one of his papers. If we recollect, on last Saturday, I made some odd for observations on some of those dangers which these gentlemen would fain persuade us hang over the citizens of, of this commonwealth, Virginia, to induce us to change the government and adopt the new plan. Unless there be great and awful dangers, the change is dangerous and the experiment ought not to be made. In estimating the magnitude of these dangers, we are obliged to take a most serious view of them, to see them, to handle them, and to be familiar with them. It is not sufficient to feign more ima mere imaginary dangers. There must be a dreadful reality. The great question between us is, does that reality exist? These dangers are partially attributed to bad laws exasper ex execrated by the community at a large. It is said the people wish to change the government. I should be happy to meet them on that ground. Should the people wish to change it, we should be innocent of the dangers. It is a fact that the people do not wish to change their government. How am I to prove it? It will rest with, on my bare assertion, unless supported by an internal conviction in men's breasts. My poor say-so is a mere non-entity. But, sir, I am persuaded that four-fifths of the people of Virginia must have amendments to the new plan to reconcile them to a change of their government. It is a slippery foundation for the people to rest on political salvation, on my or their assertions. No government can flourish unless it be founded on the affection of the people. Unless gentlemen can be sure that this new system is founded on that ground, they ought to stop their career. I will not repeat what the gentlemen say. I will mention one thing. There is a dispute between us and the Spaniards about the right of navigating the Mississippi. Seven states wish to relinquish this river to them. The six southern states opposed it. Seven states not being sufficient to convey it away, it remains now ours. <clears throat> there is no danger of a dismemberment of our country unless a constitution be adopted, which will enable the government to plant enemies on our backs. By the Confederation, the rights of territory are secured. No treaty can be made without the consent of the nine states. While the consent of the nine states is necessary to the to the cession of territory, you are safe. If it be put in the power of a less number, you will be you will most infallibly lose the Mississippi. As long as we can preserve our inalienable rights, we are in safety. This new constitution will involve in its operation the loss of the navigation of that valuable river. The honorable gentleman cannot be ignorant of the Spanish transactions. A treaty had been nearly entered into with Spain to relinquish that navigation. That relinquishment would have would absolutely have taken place had the consent of the seven states been sufficient. This new government, I conceive, will enable those states who have already discovered their inclination that way to give away this river. We are threatened with danger, according to some, for the non-payment of our debt due to France. We have information come from an illustrious citizen of Virginia who is now in Paris, which disproves the suggestion of such danger. This citizen has not been in the airy regions of theoretic speculation. Our ambassador, 
Thomas Jefferson is this worthy citizen. The ambassador of the United States of America is not so despised as the honorable gentleman would make us believe. A servant of, of a republic is as much respected as that of a monarch. The honorable gentleman tells us that hostile fleets are to be sent to make reprisals upon us. Our ambassador tells you that the King of France has taken into consideration our to enter into commercial regulations on reciprocal terms with us, which will be of peculiar advantage to us. Does this look like hostility? I might further I might go farther. I might say, not from public authority, but from good information, that his opinion is that you reject this government. His character and abilities are in the highest estimation. He is well acquainted in every respect with this country, equally so with the policy of the European nations. Let us follow the sage advice of this common friend of ours. Do you suppose the Spanish monarch will risk a contest with the United States when his feeble colonies are exposed to them? Every advance the people make to, to the westward makes them tremble for Mexico and Peru. Despised as we are among ourselves under our present government, we are terrible to that monarchy. If this be not a fact, it is generally said so. We are, in the next place, frightened by dangers from Holland. We must change our government to escape the wrath of that republic. Holland groans under a government like this new one. A stadtholder, sir, a Dutch president, has brought on that country miseries which will not permit them to collect debts with fleets or armies. This president will bring miseries on us like those of Holland. Such is the condition of European affairs that it would be unsafe for them to send fleets or armies to collect debts. But here, sir, they make a transition to objects of another kind. We are presented with dangers of a very uncommon nature. I am not acquainted with the arts of painting. Some gentlemen have a peculiar talent for them. They are practiced with great ingenuity on this occasion. As a counterpart to what we have already been intimidated with, we are told that some lands have been sold which cannot be found, and already that this will bring war on this country. Here the picture will not stand examination. Can it be supposed if a few land speculators and jobbers have violated the principles of probity that it will involve this country in war? If there is if there are no redress to be otherwise obtained, even admitting the delinquents and sufferers to be numerous, when gentlemen are thus driven to produce imaginary dangers, to induce this convention to assent to this change, I am sure it will not be uncandid to say that the change itself is really dangerous. Then the Maryland Compact is broken and will produce perilous consequences. I see nothing very terrible in this. The adoption of the new system will not remove the evil. Will they forfeit good neighborhood with us because of the compact is broken? Then the disputes concerning the Carolina line are to involve us in danger. A strip of land running from the, west, from the westward of the Allegheny to the Mississippi is the subject of this pretended dispute. I do not know the length or breadth of, of this disputed spot. They have not regularly confirmed our right to it and relinquished all claims to it. I can venture to pledge that the people of Carolina will never disturb us. Then, sir, comes Pennsylvania in terrible array. Pennsylvania is to go into conflict with Virginia. Pennsylvania has been a good neighbor here, heretofore. She is federal, something terrible. Virginia cannot look her in the face. If we sufficiently attend to the actual situation of things, we shall conclude that Pennsylvania will do what we do. A number of of that country are strongly opposed to it. Many of them 
have lately been convinced of its fatal tendency. They are disgorged of their federalism. Place yourselves in their situation. Would you fight your neighbors for considering this great and awful matter? Whatever may be the disposition of the aristocratical politicians of that country, I know there are friends of human nature in that state. So, If so, they will never make war on those who make professions of what they are, atta are attached to themselves. As to the danger rising from borders, it is mutual and recipro reciprocal. If it be dangerous for Virginia, it is equally so for them. It will be their true it, it will be their true interest to be united with us. The danger of our being their enemies will be prevailing arguments in our favor. It will be as powerful to admit us in, into the union as a vote of adoption without previous amendments could possibly be. Then the savage Indians are to destroy us. We cannot look them in the face. The danger is here divided. They are as terrible to the states as to us. But sir, it is well known that we have nothing to fear from them. Our back settlers are considerably stronger than they. Their superiority increases daily. Suppose the states to be confederated all around us. What we want in numbers, we shall make up otherwise. Our compact situation and natural strength will secure us, but to avoid all dangers, we must take shelter under the federal government. Nothing gives a, a decided importance but this federal government. You will sip sorrow, according, according to the vulgar phrase, if you want any other security than the laws of Virginia. Where is the danger, if, sir, there was any? I would recur to the American spirit to defend us, that spirit which has enabled us to surmount the greatest difficulties. To that Ill illustrious spirit, I address my most fervent prayer to prevent our adopting a system destructive to liberty. Let not gentlemen be told that it is not safe to reject this government. Wherefore is it not safe? We are told there are dangers, but those dangers are ideal and, not, and cannot be demonstrated. The Confederation, this despised government, per merits, in my opinion, the highest encomium. It carried us through a long and dangerous war. It rendered us victorious in that bloody conflict with a powerful nation. It has secured us a territory greater than any European monarch possesses, and shall a government which has been thus strong and vigorous be accused of imbecility and abandoned for, for want of energy? Consider what you are about to do before you part with the government. Take longer time in reckoning things. Revolutions like this have happened in almost every country in Europe. Similar examples are to be found in ancient Greece and ancient Rome. Instances of the people losing their liberty by their own carelessness and the ambition of a few. We are cautioned against faction and turbulence. I acknowledge that Lucentius is dangerous and that it ought to be provi yeah, provided against. I acknowledge also the new form of government may effectually prevent it. Yet there is another thing it will effectually do. It will oppress and ruin the people. Wise man, that Patrick Henry. Federalist number four. The same subject continued concerning dangers from foreign force and influence. To the people of the state of New York, my last paper assigned several reasons why the safety of the people would be best secured by union against the danger it may be exposed by just causes of war given to other nations. And those reasons show that such causes would not only be mere, more rarely given, but would also be more easily accommodated by the, a national government than either of the state governments or the imposed little confederacies. But the safety of the people of America against dangers from foreign force depends not only on their forbearing 
to give just causes for of war to other nations but also on their placing and continuing themselves in such in such a situation as not to invite hostility or insult for it need not be observed that there are pretended as well as just causes of war it is too true however disgraceful it may be to human nature the nations in general will make war whenever they have a prospect of getting anything by it nay absolute monarchs will often make war when their nations are to get nothing by it but for the purposes and objects merely personal such as a thirst for military glory revenge for personal affronts ambition or private compacts to aggrandize or support their particular families or partisans these and a variety of other motives which affect only the mind of the sovereign often lead him to engage in wars not sanctified by justice or the voice of interests of his people but independent of these inducements to war which are more prevalent in absolute monarchies but which well deserve our attention there are others which affect nations as often as kings and some of them will on examination be found to grow out of our relative situation and circumstances with France and with Britain we are rivals in the fisheries and can supply their markets cheaper than they can themselves notwithstanding any efforts to prevent it by our bounties on their own or duties on foreign fish with them and with most other European nations we are rivals in navigation and the carrying trade and we shall deceive ourselves if we suppose that any of them will rejoice to see, to see it flourish for as our carrying trade cannot increase without in some degree diminishing theirs it is more their interest and will be more their policy to restrain than to promote it in the trade to China and India we interfere with more than one nation inasmuch as it enables us to partake in advantages which they had in a manner monopolized and as we thereby supply ourselves with commodities which we use to purchase from them the extension of our own commerce and our own vessels cannot give pleasure to any nations who possesses territories on or near this continent because the cheapness and excellence of our productions added to the circumstance of vicinity and the enterprise and address of our merchant and navigators will give us a greater share in the advantages which those territories afford than, con than, than consists with the wishes or policy of their respective sovereigns. Spain thinks it convenient to shut the Mississippi against us on one side and Britain excludes us from the St. Lawrence on the other, nor will either of them permit the other waters which are between them and us become a means of mutual intercourse and traffic. From these and such considerations which might, if consistent with prudence, be more amplified and detailed, it is easy to see that jealousies and uneasiness may gradually slide into the mind, minds and cabinets of other nations and that we are not to expect that they should regard our advancement in union in power and consequence by land and sea with an eye of indifference and composure the people of america are aware that inducements to war may arise out of these circumstances as well as from others not so obvious at present and that whatever such inducements may find it fit time and opportunity for operation pretenses to color and justify them will not be wanting wisely therefore do they consider union and a good national government as necessary to put and keep them in such a situation as instead of inviting war will tend to repress and discourage it that situation consists in the best possible state of defense and necessarily de depends on the government the arms and the resources of the country 
as the safety of the whole is the interest of the whole and cannot be provided for without government either one or more or many let us inquire wh whether one good government is not relative to the object in question more competent than any other given number whatever one government can collect and avail itself of the talents and experience of the ablest men in whatever part of the union they may be found it can move on uniform principles of policy it can harmonize assimilate and protect the several parts and members and extend the benefit of its foresight and precautions to each in the formation of treaties it will regard the interest of the whole and the particular interests of the parts is connected with that of the whole it can apply to to the resources and power of the whole to the defense of any particular part and that more easily and expediently expediously than state governments or separate confederate or separate confederacies can possibly do for want of concert and unity of system it can place the militia under one plane of discipline and by putting their officers in a proper line of subordination to the chief magistrate will as it were consolidate them into one corps and thereby render them more efficient than if divided into 13 or into three or four distinct independent companies what would the militia of Britain be if the English militia obeyed the government of England if the Scotch militia obeyed the government of Scotland and the Welsh militia obeyed the government of Wales suppose an invasion would those three governments if they agreed at all be able with their respective forces to operate against the enemy so efficiently as the single government of Great Britain would we have heard much of the fleets of Britain and the time may come if we are wise when the fleets of America may engage attention but if one national government had not so regulated the navigation of Britain as to make it a nursery for seamen if one national government had not called forth all the national means and materials for forming fleets their prowess and their thunder would never have been celebrated let, let, let England have its navigation and fleet let Scotland have its navigation and fleet let Wales have its navigation and fleet let Ireland have its navigation and fleet let those four of the cons constituent parts of the British Empire be under four independent governments and it is easy to perceive how soon they will each dwindle into comparative insigni insignificance apply these facts to our own case leave America divided into 13 or if you please into three or four independent governments what armies would could they raise and pay what fleets could they ever hope to have if one was attacked would the others fly to its succor and spend their blood and money in its defense would there be no danger of their being flattered into neutrality by its spacious promises or seduced by a too great fondness for peace to decline ha hazarding their tranquility and present safety for the sake of neighbors of whom perhaps they have been jealous and whose importance they are content to see diminished although such conduct would not be wise it would nevertheless be natural the history of the states of Greece and of other countries abounds with such instances and it is not improbable that what has so often happened would under similar circumstances happen again but admit that they might be willing to help the invaded state or confederacy how and when and in what proportion shall aids of men and money be afforded who shall command the allied armies and from which of them shall be shall he receive his orders who shall settle the terms of peace and in case of disputes what umpire shall decide between them and compel acquiescence various difficulties and inconveniences 
would be inseparable from such a situation, whereas one government, watching over the general and common interests, and combining and directing the powers and resources of the whole, would be free from all these embarrassments, and conduce far more uh, to the safety of the people. But whatever may be our situation, whether firmly united under one national government, or split into a number of confederacies, certain, certain it is that foreign nations will know and view it exactly as it is, and they will act towards us accordingly. If they see that our national government is efficient and well administered, our trade prudently regulated, our militia properly organized and disciplined, our resources and finance discreetly managed, our credit re-established, our people free, contented and united, they will be much more disposed to cultivate our friendship than provoke our resentment. If on the other hand they find us either destitute of an effectual government, each state doing right or wrong, as to its rulers may seem convenient, or split into three or four independent and probably discordant republics or confederacies, one inclining to Britain, another to France, and a third to Spain, and perhaps played off against each other by the three, what a poor pitiful figure will America make in their eyes? How liable would she become not only to their contempt, but to their outrage, and how soon would dear-bought experience proclaim that when a people or family so divide, it never fails to be against themselves. Just a little more to think about. Peace.